Have you ever wondered how you can make your own CPU or microcontroller? Have you ever been curious about field programmable gate arrays, also known as FPGAs, but find them to be mysterious black boxes? Or wish you had a microcontroller-like device with a larger memory address or a wider data bus? Well, stay tuned as we delve into the world of FPGAs and create a CPU and eventual microcontroller from scratch. Hello, and welcome to 100 Random Tasks. I'm your host, Philip Lett. And if you like what you see here, please give us a like and leave a comment. And subscribe if you'd like to be notified when more videos are uploaded, and it would really help the channel. Last time, I created the 8-bit register module, which is used a total of five times in this simple CPU, and demonstrated its operation. I'll leave links to the previous videos in the description. Today, I'll be talking about how a MUX, or multiplexer, will be used inside the CPU to control data flow onto the internal data bus. So let's get started. Looking back at the outline, the program counter, data register, accumulator, and the external memory all have the ability to place data on the internal data bus. So it is essential that there is a way to control which of those has control of the bus at any given time. At one time, the use of tri-state buffers would be used. That is, when the enable pin of the buffer is active, the output would equal what the input is. And when the enable line is inactive, the output would be tri-stated or set to a high impedance state, which would source or sync zero current, essentially disconnecting it from the circuit. In FPGAs though, tri-state internal buffers are not used, and instead, multiple inputs are funneled through a multiplexer, ensuring that only one source is driving the bus. So how does a multiplexer work? If you look at the basic AND gate and label one pin as input and one pin as control, as I have here, then from the truth table, it can be seen that the output is zero if the control pin is zero. And the output follows the input pin if the control pin is one. How can we control data this way? If we expand on this slightly, as I've shown here, I have two AND gates with their outputs ORed together, with the C pin of the bottom AND gate inverted, as shown by this bubble. What this does is if the C pin is a 1, A passes the AND gate, and the B AND gate output is 0. Since the bottom input to the OR gate is now 0, whatever the output of the upper AND gate is gets passed through to the output. Conversely, if the C pin is 0, the upper AND gate output is 0, and the lower AND gate output is B, which is then passed through the OR gate to the output. In this way, we can control the flow of data, either A or B, to the output, depending on the state of the C pin, which can be seen in the truth table. With C equal to 0, the output is B, and if C is 1, the output is A. Finally, we can expand to accommodate four inputs, but this will need two control lines. Following the same logic as above, A, B, C, or D can be funneled to the output based on the states of S0 and S1, as seen from the truth table. The simple CPU has four registers that can access the data bus. So this is what we will be creating today, and you'll see just how simple it is to generate this in Verilog. Okay, back in the IDE again, and I've created a new project called Mux Testing. Again, I have a schematic as the top level and an empty pin constraints file. So let's go ahead and create the Mux module. As before, I'll create a new Verilog file and name it Mux4. I'll add the inputs and the output. I'll change the O label to a register as before. Then I'll add the code to control the MUX. And that's it. Here you'll see that I have an asterisk in the always statement. <clears throat> what this says is to, to do the case statement on any pin change. The case has four possible options depending on the value of the select lines, and the value of A, B, C, or D will be sent to the output. Short and simple, just like last time. Now let's create the schematic symbol for it and add it to the top level and connect the I.O. markers.
Lastly, we'll set up the constraints file to locate the physical pins and implement the design. and we'll generate the programming file. So let's wire up our prototype and see how it works. For this demonstration, we're going to use four dip switches for the A, B, C, D inputs, a dual dip switch for the select 0 and 1, and an LED for an output. Let's wire that up. Next I'll program the Spartan, and you can check the previous videos if you want more details on how that works. Right now, with all inputs A through D are low, and S1 and S0 are low, and the LED is off. With S0 and S1 low, the A input should be active, so if I set A high, the LED should turn on. And it does. So if I set A back to low and change any other input, the LED should stay off. And it does. Now if I set S0 to high, it should now select B. And if I set B to high, the LED should turn on, which it does. If I leave B high and change S0, S1 to high, the LED should go out because it is now selecting the D input, which is low, which it also does. Setting D to high then changes the output to high, and it changes as expected. Now that we know the multiplexer is working, we can go ahead and create the final MUX in the CPU project and add it to the design. Back in the simple CPU project, and I'll add a new Verilog file as before called MUX and set up the inputs and the outputs. 
The file will be exactly the same as the example I just showed, except the ports will be set to 8 bits instead of 1. Next I'll add it to the top level and make all the connections. With that, the simple CPU now has almost all the external connections needed. Clock, reset, address bus, and data bus. All that's left is the read and write lines. I've also added an output buffer on our data bus since the data bus itself is bidirectional and we need to control the flow of information whether it comes in or out. I've redrawn the outline to now show the MUX controlling access to the internal data bus and it being the only component that can drive it. All other components can only read from the bus, preventing bus contention. And that's where I'll end it for today. Next time, we'll verify the design so far and see if we can't move data around the registers. And if you've made it this far into the video, thanks for watching and subscribe to see future videos. See you next time.